everyone. Um, is this thing on? Ah, it is. Hi everyone. Um, I see there's already somebody uh, getting to the um, Slido. And if you have a mobile phone, please go to Slido.com and with 00412 as the code. And you can ask me any question even during my presentation and I will try to work my speech so it includes people's questions. And also uh, at the end of the 20 minutes talk, I will also reserve another 20 minutes uh, with this content of my speech entirely determined by your Slido question. And if you see a question somebody already asked that you want to like, you can just press like and we'll go to the top and I will start from the start. So without further ado, uh, I'm very happy to be here at CodeGate uh, to share with you some stories in uh, the past couple of years that we have worked toward the open government. Uh, this is our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, when she was uh, elected uh, last year, I was very happy I voted for her, uh, not knowing that I would become a cabinet member. And I voted for her for many reasons, but a gut feeling reason was that uh, I'm an animal lover. I live with seven cats and two dogs, and she is a fellow animal lover uh, who lives with uh, two cats and three dogs, and she's very much into animal welfare, even animal rights, and a lot of uh, rights for the Aborigines, for diversity, for LGBTQ, and so on. And because um, I agree with her politics, I vote for her, but also more importantly, she believes in a political system that is post-partisan system. Uh, and this is our first family, by the way, literally uh, our first family. And then, um, as I mentioned, uh, in Taiwan, we have four months of transition time between the presidential election and the new cabinet actually taking into office. But those four months were very peaceful. And one of the reasons is our previous minister, uh, Prime Minister Simon Chong, who was a Google engineer, belongs to no parties, he is independent. And his successor, our current Prime Minister Lin Chen, is also independent. So between the two independent ministers, um, they did a transition based on the principle of transparency and open data. Uh, back when Simon Zhang was the premier, he mandated that all the ICT systems, um, which was constructed for less than about one million US dollars, must be open data by default, of course, protecting national security and privacy, but otherwise it's open by default. This made Taiwan into the first place into the global open data index. So continuing with this kind of thought, uh, during the transition, he ordered all the ministries to produce a checkpoint document. Basically, you have a um, checkpoint image of all the ministries' policy making and upload it to the public internet for the next cabinet to download. So this is not a transition between two parties, but a transition to the general public with the checkpoint documents and for everybody, me included, to study the documents and understand where the uh, country is going. So um, in her inauguration speech, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, expressed her idea. She said, um, before, democracy in Taiwan was a clash between two opposing values. But from this point onward, it needs to become a conversation between a diverse, many different values. And it is by this vision uh, do we further the idea of open government. But Taiwan was not always like this. Uh, the idea of equal participation, of radical transparency, really only started during 2014, where we had half a million people on the street uh, and occupied the parliament for 22 days. It is the Sunflower Movement. During the Sunflower Movement, it is not just a protest, because it starts by having the students taking the parliament doing the job that the legislators refuse to do. The legislators refuse to deliberate a trade service agreement, and the students and occupiers are trying to find a way for half a million people, anybody who shows up on the Occupy, to deliberate, to see what people's feelings really are to work this uh, agreement, to build consensus. So during that time, the movement that I, I participated in, the Gov Zero movement, handled the information and communication technology infrastructures for the occupiers. And the Gov Zero movement started in 2012, 
with this very simple hack of the government, we fork government websites. If you see a government website in Taiwan, it always ends with gov.tw. So for example, the parliament will be ly.gov.tw. And then we build a shadow legislative government and we have the URL ly.g0v.tw. And this solves the discoverability problem because you don't have to Google for it. You just take the official website, change the O to a zero, and you get into the shadow government, which is built using the principle of open data and crowdsourcing and participation. And after uh, forking the government websites this way, like I did uh, with a lot of friends for the dictionary website, we abandon our copyright, we donate it to the public domain, so that when the government renews its website again, it can take our contributions into the official government website, and many ministries already did that, as well as local governments. So the idea is hacking the government, but not you know, demolishing or causing chaos, but making patches, making a better fork in the hope that government will merge it back in. But why are there so many civic hackers in Taiwan who want to work collaboratively with government this way? I think it was because when I learned uh, programming when I was eight years old in 1989, it was also the year in Taiwan where we have press freedom after 30 years of martial law and censorship of speech. Finally, we have freedom of speech and then we have personal computers in the same year. And in the same pattern, in 1996, uh, when we had our first presidential election, it was also the year where World Web becomes affordable. So uh, in Taiwan, when we see free software, we don't think about free as in you know, not paying, but free as in protecting the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of creation, the, free, the software freedoms, and the cultural freedoms uh, that we're, we fought so much to get and would not want to lose. So I think this is why when we see policy making no longer responding to the newest technologies and the government systems doesn't make the full use of its ICT capabilities, instead of just shouting and blaming the government, we say, okay, we fork the government, we try to work some experimental way so the government works better with us. So I will very quickly uh, describe one case where we collaboratively did a policy making on. Um, back in 2014, there was this company called Uber, uh, which starts its service in Taiwan. It starts operating legally, but then it starts hiring uh, drivers without professional uh, licenses. And the whole idea of Uber was this meme, this virus of the mind. It, it's basically saying algorithms dispatch better than regulations, and so people don't have to follow regulations. And this kind of memes is very different from traditional um, interest groups, because the interest group you're facing was one person, but with this kind of meme, you're basically con containing, trying to find out where this virus come from, and there's very little that the state can do to a virus of the mind like this. So our idea, which we learned during the Sunflower Movement, was just to get all the stakeholders, uh, the passengers, the drivers, to sit down and talk and listen to each other and come to an understanding. Because deliberation in this kind of common understanding really is the vaccine, the inoculation against virus of the mind. When we have considered other people's positions and arrived to something that people can live with, people become immune to uh, future propaganda or rumors or things like that. So we started by collecting all the facts that we have and then determining using machine learning and a gamified interface people's feelings toward those facts. And then we start with the ideas and the best ideas are the ones that take care of most people's feelings. And then we turn those ideas into regulation. So before we introduce this kind of policy making, the old way of making policies was just the government talking with some private sector association heads and some academics or some professors, but they use an expert language and do not speak to the public before they arrive to a conclusion. But people on the street can also talk about this, but they more and more use one word for different meanings so that people live essentially in different realities. And when people don't have the same agreement on the basic facts, they stop paying attention to each other's feelings and ideas become ideologies. Ideologies to me are an even more dangerous kind of virus of the mind because they blind us to new facts and blind us to each other's feelings. 
So we start always by releasing open data and asking the private sector and civil society to share as much factual data as possible as the ground truth for discussion. And then on the feeling stage, we use this POLIS system for online facilitation for three weeks. The whole idea is that you can go to this website using your phone and then answer yes or no to the question of do you feel that insurance is important, for example, and so on. As you answer yes or no, your position changes in this principal component uh, visualization graph, which dynamically recalculates your position among your Twitter friends and your Facebook friends. And this has two uh, important effects. First, even people who are against you are your friends. It's just you didn't talk about this over dinner. So it makes people not antagonize each other, consider each other as enemies. And second, it makes it people see that people's position can change because we say we only take the sentiments that is agreed by a super majority of people, 80% or more of people, as the binding agenda. So the idea is that the terms that we negotiate with Uber is determined collectively by everybody involved, but you have to convince everybody of your feelings. And once you answer a few yes or no questions, you can then propose your own feelings and then for other people to vote on is an iterative, recursive process. So after three weeks or so, we actually have a strong consensus of seven items that more than 80% of people agree with, which are consistent across all the different sectors. And it is through to this consensus, we run a live consultation. Everything is live streamed. Everything is on the record. People can just say you know, anything knowing that it was uh, listened to by thousands of people. So they won't just randomly say things and go and deny it. But everything is on the record. And so after getting everybody understanding the feasibility of these consensus items, we then translate it into regulation and then finally ratify it. And so this ratification is very important because then Uber just today announced that they will agree to play by these rules starting tomorrow. And so this is knowing that for the passengers and of course the drivers and so on can all get behind these consensus items. So after I become the digital minister, I started this uh, public digital innovation space, which is a way for agile, open source, hacker-like mentality in the public sector for people who work in the career public service uh, to join. And I started by having this direct line to the digital minister, so anybody can ask me any question and I will try to answer it within 24 hours. But this is not one-on-one, -on -one because every answer is then public and sent to thousands of subscribers, the journalists, everybody is equal on this platform. So it's a, a frequently asked questions and I won't have to answer the same questions twice. And the second thing that I did was I practiced radical transparency so that all the meetings I hold, all the interviews that I give and every uh, venues that I chair uh, a multi-stakeholder meeting are turned into this real-time transcript which has this XML encoded. And so you can do a lot of semantic analysis on it. So even Uber's David Kluth, when he visited me, gets 360 recorded and turned into a transcript so that the missing stakeholders in the room can nevertheless participate in future discussions without um, getting a partial information. So we do our agenda setting using all kinds of very uh, startup-like uh, methods. And we also pay attention to cybersecurity. The first thing I did literally when becoming a digital minister is to recompile the Linux kernel because the Linux kernel of our internal system are too old and they will not run uh, secure computing and Linux containers. And so after recompiling the kernel and they installed a cybersecurity product called Sensorm.io which then takes a lot of collaborative open source systems into our everyday use and so it got popularized into the national administration and we're now spreading it to the local administrations. And it has Kanban board, it has either Calc, either Pad, and it has a lot of collaboration tools. So um, to finish my talk, I would like to play uh, a PDIS movie to introduce the PDIS members who cannot be here physically. There's only three of us here, but many others would want to make an appearance. Uh, so would you please uh, play the video, uh, the YouTube video? Hello, I'm Hong Kong. 
今天呢，啊，我们要用 VR， 也们要用 3D 投影，就是呢，跟大家讲一下，怎么样做一道美味的开放年菜，好的好菜头。话不多说，让我们继续看下去。首先呢，要做出好菜的第一道工序，不外乎是慎选食材，打好基底，任何在厨房发生的事情都要开放透明。能够经得起检验。大家好，我们来看看今天为大家准备了什么食材。青椒菜、红萝卜、绿豆、洋葱、青椒、高丽菜、红葱、绿豆、豆汁授权、结构化资料、Open API， 以及一颗愉快的心，一起来准备这个开放政府大火锅。哎，我来了。跟大家说一下，虽然开放是很重要，但是呢，保障人民的隐私权也是很重要。火锅的关键就在于高汤，高汤呢就是要使用洋葱、胡萝卜、芹菜一起熬煮，大约七七四十个小时，然后最后还要用昆布、菜头来增加高汤的深度。等一下，等一下，不对不对，我告诉你，我妈妈教我们家祖传八百年的，这个汤底里面一定要有葱、姜、蒜、辣椒、花椒，要先炒过。再放那个中药，八角啦、小茴啦、桂皮啦，然后这些东西争什么争？别再争了，让线上正在参与公共政府开放直播的网友来告诉大家，争什么？掺在一起做就你平台大火锅不就行了？笨蛋！他后面有说笨蛋吗？<笑>嗯，这食材真新鲜，是谁负责的、啊？哎，是我。哦，哦，这汤头真甘醇，是谁负责的、啊？是我，我，我，我。我不，火锅最重要的就是沾酱了，所以我说那个酱汁呢，碰上。呃，没事。吃吗？那这个猫舌饭可以吃吗？哎，这个乳糖不耐可以吃吗？哎，这个减肥可以吃吗？大家放心，我们火锅制定的过程不但从最先期就纳入了各界的专业意见，而且呢，在过程里面也会照顾到各个不同的利益相关的群体的声音。只有这样子，才能够让全民的腰围，呃，不，幸福指数达到最大值。我从来没有吃过这么开放的火锅，食材料理方式都公开在里面，参与的关系人都可以尽情的发言，再配合逐字稿的发布，可以让外界了解料理的过程。为什么？为什么要让我吃到这么开放的火锅？要是我以后吃不到怎么办呢、啊？没有关系，不怕吃不到，现在就上 P D S 点 T W 公共数位创新空间小组的网站，让大家随时都能够更新开放政府的资讯。P D S 祝大家。That I will start answering、uh, your questions.、Uh, there's now many questions. I may or may not be able to go through it all, but I'll, I'll try.、Um, the top question at the moment is, what do I think of IoT hacking? Because the Internet of Things is evolving day by day and can affect actual life. How do we defend、uh, the Internet of Things space?、Um, this is a, a great question.、Um, security for me、um, has two meanings. One is a property of a system.、Uh, for example, you can do proof carrying code. You can do a lot of verification. You can do a lot of、uh, mathematics to ensure the property of a system. But this is a mathematical definition. There's also the social, psychological, which is people's feeling of feeling secure. Now, when these two match, of course, it is the best thing that you have a, a provable secure system with people who feel secure about it. But not everybody is a mathematician. So you get disconnects. You get things that are pretty secure, but people are not willing to believe that it's secure. Or the worst case, you get security theater, which is the mathematics says that it's all wrong. It doesn't have the property, but people are led to believe that it should be secure. 
And the, the last case is very bad because when people then get shocked that it doesn't really have the property, people tend to panic instead of you know, finding interesting or useful way around the question. So I really think literacy is the most important thing, which is why in Taiwan, instead of starting programming at a primary school, we start at junior high school. But at primary school, what we focus on is computational thinking, it's design thinking, it's media literacy. It is basically understand how algorithm works instead of just learning to code as one class. And we say you have to integrate it with all the classes, all the disciplines, so people can know that code is behind all those disciplines and how to think in terms of code and collaborate not just with humans but also with machines. And so when people um, are learned in this way, I believe people will be much more likely to understand the mathematical explanations and ask of the technology instead of having the technology demand of us. And so when, when it be IoT or autonomous car or so on, we will get a, a teenagers asking to run in the simulation to test its mathematical properties to really make an effort to understand its system and how it interacts with human beings instead of blindly accepting any advertisement or something. I think it's of uh, uh, utmost importance. And to the person uh, operating the computer, uh, can you click the uh, left button corner? There's a link that says presentation mode. It will make it much easier to read. Thank you. Um, right. And then I'm very sorry that um, I didn't read Korean. So um, I should probably feed it to machine translation at this point, uh, which I will attempt to do, not necessarily. Um, Unnecessarily working. Um, let's see. All right. Um, so the question is if machine translating is to be believed. Um, wow. Um, the AI really doesn't do a good job on this one. Uh, I, I don't really understand the question. I'm so sorry. Um, so I will read what Google think of it. Good morning. The digital minister is somewhat unfamiliar. There seem to be no exact matching department in our country. The question is, is there a limitation of political power in establishing and practicing digital policy in Taiwan? Welcome to Korea. Well, thank you for the welcome. This is my first time here. Um, so um, I, I don't know whether there is an equivalent of PIDIS, but we did uh, learn a lot from white papers published by the government 3.0. Uh, effort here. I think that's the closest as uh, the open government work that we've been doing. And I look forward uh, tomorrow to exchange ideas not just around IoT and Smart City, but through um, e government and government modernization and digital um, administration with the GOV uh, 3.0 people. So at the moment, I don't have answers, but I have a lot of questions which I should uh, ask tomorrow. So another question pertains to my future plan. Um, the question was, until when will I be a civic hacker? Do I have uh, ultimate goals in terms of democratic value? This is a great question. So um, I was a civic hacker since at least the Blue Ribbon uh, EFF days, that's 1996. So it's a very long time now. Uh, I plan to be a civic hacker all my life. Uh, so um, I think the idea of civic hacking is really um, a refusal to feel helpless. So if you've ever feel helpless by the bureaucratic system and so on, the internet is great because you can always find like-minded people everywhere in the world and somehow link with solidarity and share your contributions, your hopes, your dreams, your fears. And the idea here is that every progress that we make is meaningful in itself. There is no ultimate value that everybody should go to. In a democratic society, everyone is their own dimension, just as we saw in the principal component analysis on polis. So everybody determines their life's direction. And if we happen to overlap in our vectors, then we can share and collaborate. But well, uh, I don't believe in one ultimate value that everybody should go to. Uh, if I am, I wouldn't be an anarchist. Um, the other question pertains to uh, what do I think of IoT security. I think I already answered that. The next thing is what social network do I use mostly? This is a, a good question. Um, if you go to my Facebook page, uh, I have two plugins. 
One is uh, the link to the newsfeed eradicator, which when you install, it removes the newsfeed uh, altogether. And then the next one is called Silent FB. If you install it, all the pictures in Facebook become grayscale. So this is how I guard my mind against uh, mental pollution. The idea is that when I use Facebook, I expect what is uh, that I'm seeing. I have to consciously make a decision to go to someone or some group's page and look at its content instead of having the algorithm feed me uh, information. And even if I look at a picture on Facebook, it is always grayscale until I move my mouse uh, on the picture where it turns colorful so that my sentiments will not be manipulated by the algorithm. So I still use Facebook, but with cyber security, well, mental, psychological security uh, defense system. Uh, and I also use Twitter. Uh, I used to use Google Plus, not so much anymore. Uh, but mostly, I just join IRC as everybody does uh, nowadays through gateways to Telegram, through uh, gateways to Slack, and uh, most uh, use system at the moment is Rocket Chat, which I have uh, set up internally in the administration for all the previous people to collaborate with all the ministries in Taiwan. Basically, we have each ministry. 32 ministry pick one to four people as the C participation officers who learn how to use Rocket Chat, how to use Etherpad, how to use those collaborative tools, and they then can uh, teach their ministries to how to use those collaborative tools. So we're trying to set up social networks by internally and in a secure fashion. Do many people in Taiwan contribute to open source projects? Yes. Our uh, local annual conference, the Coast Cup conference, um, is thousands of people every year with more people growing. And then uh, practically every language uh, has its own meetups and its conferences. We used to run this open source developer conference, which is you know, also hundreds if not thousands of people. But because each language has grew out of the, the venue, now every language has its own uh, large conference, as well as new technologies like Docker, Kubernetes, uh, TensorFlow, whatever, right? So yes, we do contribute to open source projects. And it's also because Taiwan uh, software is at many times a a subsidiary to the hardware manufacturers. So software is a way to save money. And so people would, of course, want to donate uh, their code because then the community maintains it instead of having a hardware company uh, maintaining their own software system. I think that also contributes to the economic situation. What is the best way for people to encourage other people to join and contribute open source projects? Well, it depends. Um, for me, uh, the easiest way is to uh, working with journalists and uh, people who want to interview me and say I, I will not agree to an interview and unless you accept the Creative Commons license. And people will ask what is Creative Commons and then I give them a lecture on Creative Commons. So the basic idea is that we have a, a, a public um, domain, a commons, for everybody to, to contribute to. And then people can just think it's just for hackers, just for coders. But I would tell people that no, if you write articles, if you remix music, if you make art, you can also contribute to the commons. It's not just for coders. And I find people much more receptive this way because many creators want their creations to be seen by a lot of people. And if you show them that creative commons is an effective way for, for their work to be seen widely, then they will uh, join with a lot more um, motivation. I don't know about digital minister. Can you explain about digital minister? Of course. Uh, what you're seeing now is the analog version of digital minister. I usually uh, present uh, using virtual reality and robotics and whatever. Uh, and the idea of digital minister in Taiwan is to work with all the ministries. I don't have my own ministry. Work with all the ministries to make sure that when they turn their paper-based paperwork workflow system into digital tools, they don't blindly replicate the workflow of paper-based tools of the same bureaucratic system. The work of digital minister is to look at the existing workflows and then determine whether digital tools can change the workflow so that they can work across units, across departments, across ministries. Um, and this is something unique with digital tools because with paper-based tools or with radio and television, it's very easy for one person to speak to thousands of people, but only with digital tools like 
Slido, can we listen to thousands of people and a thousand of people listen to each other? So the digital minister's work is just to introduce this kind of scalable listening to the administration. Um, the other question says, what is hacking to me? For me, um, hacking is to understand the detail of a system. And you understand it so, so much, you immerse into it, so that you feel that uh, the system and you becomes a symbiotic connection. You can feel the system. And then after getting this kind of immersiveness, of course, you find the shortcomings, the loopholes, and so on of the system. And of, of course, black hats exploit it and white hats catch it. But for me, I'm a hacker with no hats now. Uh, when I immerse myself with the bureaucratic system, I try to find a new system that doesn't suffer from the same loopholes, but I will not exploit the existing system, nor will I want to fix it. I would just be uh, building a demonstration of a new kind of system that doesn't suffer the same problem of the old system. Is there any difficulty running PETIS? The open government uh, and open data movement seems really nice, but also difficult to run it. I think my, uh, the lesson that I learned running PETIS is that the public service system is comprised with career public servants. And the career public servants are already pretty overworked. So if instead of paper data, they now have to also prepare open data, it doubles their work and they need to go home, you know, later in the day, maybe 10 p.m., and they, they will uh, rebel against you and this will be a lot of difficulty. But if instead you introduce machines, you introduce workload that makes their workload lighter, and you introduce automation to make their life's quality better so that all the automation is done by machines and human do, you know, value um, judgmental uh, work that requires human value judgment, then they derive much more meaning in their work and also they can go home earlier. So if I uh, push all the regulations and everything without thinking about the life quality of public service, of course it would be difficult, but because so far all the work that I do is crowdsourced from the participation offices of every ministry who uh, further their own agenda and lighten their workload and they can go home earlier, then in that way I encounter very little uh, resistance. A person said, hack me. Uh, that is exactly what I'm doing. Did you already feel the spirit? Okay. Um, there's the other question uh, that's written in Korean. Let me try the luck with, uh, with this LSTM network. Um, hello, I am jealous that I will meet the minister of the new council of digital department, but I do not see the information. I wonder if the minister is involved in making it legal. Um, well, we, we don't have a digital department, that's, that's for sure. But I think what we have is better. <coughs> we have each ministry uh, participating in this um, workspace, this global workspace inside the government in the form of a collaboration platform. Um, the new theories of human consciousness and animal consciousness now says that maybe we are conscious not because that we have more neurons compared to earlier animals. It's because we have a few neurons that encompass the whole of the brain that uh, provides a global workspace for all the parts of the brain to work together. And this is what I'm trying to do. It is not to set up one more cortex, one more compartment in the government, but rather have all the departments in the government gradually become self-aware and aware of each other's work. I think this is the, the main idea. Um, the other question says, would you share your transcript of meeting with Korean uh, government people tomorrow? Yeah, of course. Uh, anything that I do on the record, uh, I will first uh, go through this uh, machine learning based transcription system and then edit it. And usually I give 10 working days uh, for me and the guests and for everybody involved to make edits so that it makes sure that uh, we don't do typos and if they can supplement information they can do and so on. And afterwards I will publish it on pds.tw. If you go to pds.tw, you can click track and then you will see all the um, meetings and everything that I had with government people before. Uh, I'm afraid that this is the last question that I will answer because I only have one minute now. It's another Korean question. Um, it says, do you think it is necessary for the public to open public data for the public's right to know? 
Yes, of course. Uh, and Taiwan has uh, a relatively new uh, FOI, Freedom of Information Law, passed in 2005. And the open data movement in Taiwan is basically saying the public information is good, but its public meaning is read only. But open means read right. It means that you can take it and make a remix, make a visualization, make an interactive game uh, out of it. So we use the CC BY permissive license. And it's not just public information, but also data, meaning that it needs to be published in a way that's structured so that the computer can process it as easy as human beings. And this is important because more and more we rely on data to determine the policy. So if we cannot present the evidence as part of the narrative, we, we will never build trust with people. And it's only through making the model and the decision evidence possible, not just the human readable slides, uh, can we win the trust of people. So before we ask people to trust us, we need to trust people to not misinterpret those data. And this is the main work that I've been doing. So now uh, we're at time. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.